Good morning and welcome to our service for Sunday the 27th of September 2020. Welcome whether this is your first time or whether you've been here many times before. Either way, I'm glad you were able to join us. You'll find on our website and our Facebook page there's a link to a, play, a YouTube playlist um, with some music that you might find helpful for this morning's worship. Um, either to play beforehand, afterhand or in between hand, <clears throat> whichever suits you. There's also details of the readings that support this morning's worship. So welcome and let's begin with prayer. Gracious and hospitable God who turns no one away, welcome each one of us now in this time of worship and gathering and embrace us in your being. Sometimes, Lord, we think that the more we have, the happier we will be. If only, and then all will be well. We sometimes turn the other way, closing our eyes and our ears, ignoring what we see and choosing to neglect those asking for help. Sometimes we refuse a helping hand to those in need. We want to do our thing instead. We want to confess these things. But Lord, in this moment, in this place, in this space that we've been given, give us the desire to confess our failings and our sins. Renew us from within and set us free from all that shackles us. Set us free to be the human beings that you would have us be. Amen. <clears throat> Please join me as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. We have two readings this morning and we're still following the theme of creation, but we've moved on from the actual creation itself to our place in that creation. <clears throat> I'm going to begin back in Genesis, but chapter 9, beginning to read at verse 1. God blessed Noah and his sons. He said, Prosper, reproduce, fill the earth. Every living creature, birds, animals, fish, will fall under your spell and be afraid of you. You're responsible for them. All living creatures are yours for food, just as I gave you the plants. Now I give you everything else. Except for meat with its lifeblood still in it. Don't eat that. But your own lifeblood I will avenge. I will avenge it against both the animals and other humans. Whoever sheds human blood by humans, let his blood be shed. Because God made humans in his image, reflecting God's very nature. You're here to bear fruit, reproduce, lavish life upon earth, live bountifully. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons. I'm setting up my covenant with you, including your children who will come after you, along with everything alive around you, birds, farm animals, wild animals that came out of the ship with you. I'm setting up my covenant with you that never again will every living thing be destroyed by floodwaters. No, never again will a flood destroy the earth. God continued, <clears throat> this is is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and everything living around you and everyone living after you. I'm putting my rainbow in the clouds, a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. From now on, when I form a cloud over the earth and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and everything living that never again will floodwaters destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll see it and remember the eternal covenant 
between God and everything living, every last living creature on earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I've set up between me and everything living on the earth. So Noah built his ark and they went in the ark. And as the song goes, the rains came down and the floods came up. And 40 days later, the floods subsided sufficiently for them to be able to get out onto land again. And this is the promise that God made after this major flood. And this wasn't necessarily just a local flood. This was a major, major flood. God putting things right on the earth and promising that he won't take that kind of action ever again. <clears throat> but in so doing, he's reminding Noah that his job is to look after the earth, that it will be there for his taking care. I'm going to read now from Matthew chapter 10. Just a couple of verses, well three actually, <clears throat> beginning to read at verse 28 in Matthew chapter 10. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There's nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God, who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. What's the price of a pet canary? Some loose change, right? And God cares what happens to it even more than you do. He pays even greater attention to you, down to the last detail, even numbering the hairs on your head. So don't be intimidated by all this bully talk. You're worth more than a million canaries. Stand up for me against world opinion, and I'll stand up for you before my Father in heaven. If you turn tail and run, do you think I'll cover for you? It's the famous passage about God knowing the number of hairs on your head. For some, that's a short sum. For others, that's a major job. Isn't wildlife wonderful? The beauty, complexity and sheer oddity of wild nature have such a powerful appeal. Genesis 1 tells us that the creation reveals God's character and how he sees that what he has made shows that he is good and that he makes good things. Creation is that which breathes through God, a material entity in which the creator moves and lives, revealing his character and declaring his glory. There's a number of passages, if we look, especially in the New Testament, where God and his character and our human nature are linked together. We learn a lot about his character when we look at the wildlife that we find in this world. But the value of non-human creation goes deeper than its value to people. In Genesis, we hear about how God tells Noah to save the Earth's biodiversity, to, share, to save the sheer variety of species that he has created, <clears throat> to keep their various kinds of life throughout the Earth, implying that their value is not tied to their usefulness to Noah or to us. When God sends the rainbow as a sign of his covenant promise, it's a promise that includes more than Noah and his descendants. <coughs> Several times in that chapter, God repeats that his covenant is with every living creature on earth. His covenant is with the earth. It's with all life on earth. If you remember from last week's reading, when we were looking at Job, God asks Job, who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it? 
God's purposes within creation are beyond our understanding and even the importance of humanity. And Paul in Colossians 1 says that Jesus' saving work was to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. All things, that includes non-human creation, reconciled and brought back into relationship to God through Christ's saving work. So it seems from the biblical account that God unequivocally loves all creation for its own sake, not for our sake. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And the passage from Noah, oh dear, the passage from Matthew reveals that God cares about all of creation, not just us human beings. Noah's Ark can be seen as a picture of planet Earth today, a planet where we're all squashed in together, often competing for space and resources, and yet a planet where God has made enough for everyone, if only we can recognise our interdependence. God's made a world where the welfare of each species is dependent on the welfare of many other, where complex ecosystems interact with one another. And we 21st century human beings sometimes deceive ourselves that we can actually make it on our own. <clears throat> but we can't. We're as dependent on healthy ecosystems as the smallest plant or insect, or as the poorest subsistence farmer in a developing country. Let's take one example of the honeybee. There's been a lot of publicity about the rapid decline in honeybee populations, and the causes are complex and uncertain. In some parts of the world, previously known viruses have killed 90 previously unknown viruses, should I say, have killed 90% of bee populations. In other places, it appears that neurotoxin pesticides or direct environmental pollution seem to be responsible. But whatever the cause is and to what extent human beings are directly responsible, we're now realising how closely our welfare is tied to the humble honeybee. It is estimated that 70% of all crops are pollinated by bees. And in the unlikely but scary event that they become extinct, it's estimated that many ecosystems would collapse. And some people claim that humanity itself would be threatened with extinction too. Now, whether or not that's scaremongering, it just illustrates how closely our welfare is tied to that of other parts of God's creation. <coughs> Without bees, there would certainly be no land flowing with milk and honey. In God's creation, all our relationships within the whole of creation are essential. In the story of Noah's Ark, we see that God is equally interested in rescuing human and non-human from the threat of disaster. In fact, the ark is largely full of all the other species, with only a very few human, human beings on board. And God also makes it clear that the animals, the birds and the creeping things are not simply included for Noah's sake, but because they have value in their own right. They are to be included to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. In other words, the God who made every creature and who, stains all, who sustains all life on earth is committed to what today we'd call biodiversity conservation. When God sends a rainbow as a sign of his covenant promise, it's a promise that includes more than Noah and his descendants. <clears throat> Several times in that chapter, he refers to every living creature on earth and all life on earth. And somehow our salvation theology as Christians got just a tad too small. It focused largely on God's saving plans for people like me and you. And it has forgotten that God might have a bigger picture. Noah reminds us that God has plans that are far bigger than us. And St. Paul reminds us 
that Jesus was saving to reconcile to himself all things. And all things includes non-human creation, reconciled, brought back into relationship to God through Christ's saving work. <coughs> Excuse me. Noah also reminds us of how we human beings fit into God's bigger plans for the whole of creation. From God's perspective, we're not simply randomly evolved species amongst the millions of other species. We have been set apart with a particular role and a calling within creation. At the time of the Great Flood, God had a plan to save people and other animals. And he could have implemented that plan by himself, but he chose to use a human being, <clears throat> a creature made in his image to fulfil his plans. We might think that Noah was the first great conservationist, but in another sense he was also a first great missionary. He was the first person that God gave a specific calling and job description to, a mission to fulfil. And his mission was very specific. You and I are probably not called to build large wooden boats. Yet the wider picture, looking after God's creation, is something that we're all called to. Back in the first two chapters of Genesis, the creation account shows God's very first words to human beings as a call to responsible leadership within creation. <clears throat> And in the message version, which is probably the version I read from a couple of weeks back, God says, let us make human beings in our image, making them reflect our nature so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, the earth itself and every, <clears throat> every animal that moves on the face of the earth. This responsibility for creation's welfare is fundamental to who we are as human beings. It's not about having a dominion that results in domination and exploitation. It's rather about reflecting God's image in how we exert our rule and responsibility for creation's well-being. And so we can truly say that wildlife conservation is an essential expression of Christian mission. <clears throat> The increasingly well-known and widely adopted five marks of mission explore how following Christ means a full engagement with all that God calls his people into in his world. To proclaim the good news of the kingdom, to teach and baptise and nurture new believers, to respond to human need by loving service, to seek to transform unjust structures of society, and last but not least, to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation, and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Seeking God's kingdom on earth, as it is in heaven, means holding to a vision of all creation working together in harmony. And we have to seek lifestyles and policies that both help the world's poor, but also protect the biodiversity and to resist pressures that drive a wedge between these goals. Amen. I've done something different with the prayers of intercession this morning. I'm going to show a presentation, a presentation which is actually Psalm 104. And it's split up into verses, and with each verse is a picture of an element of creation. Views, lands, lands, animals, birds, trees, flowers, all different parts of creation. And as you watch the presentation, wonder at the creativity of the creation. Be amazed by the sheer diversity <clears throat> of this world that we live in and accept that we have a major part to play in protecting and helping this world in which we live.
for our sake, but also for the sake of the Creator, who loves everything that he created. So enjoy this presentation. I hope you were able to enjoy that, to see the scenes, <clears throat> the views, the animals, the birds, and appreciate this wonderful world that we live in. Next week would be our harvest festival. 
but of course we're not meeting in the church and so we might have to do things slightly differently. So watch this space as I work out exactly how to do what my plan is to do a prayer walk around parts of Failsworth, to pray for different parts and to give thanks for all that God has done for us. I'm hoping there will also be a way that you can bring some offerings, a few tins or packets or whatever that you've got lying around in the pantry that you're not going to use <clears throat> or that you've bought specially that we can donate to the food bank to help those who do not have enough to help themselves. And so may we go, Lord, <clears throat> to meet the needs of others and to share the love that we have from you. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. So stay safe. Stay safe and I hope to see you again.